when Lewis Baker rattled in a goal of the season contender to put Reading 1-0 up at Hull on Saturday, it seemed like a triumphant stride clear of relegation trouble was truly on the cards for the Royals. Alas, three whole goals later left us back on the edge of the drop zone. Just one goal, just one point, that's the story of episode 191 of the Tyler Sim Podcast. Welcome, I'm your host Mark Mayo, as per usual, and joining me on this uh, late Monday evening, we've really found any nook and cranny we can to get in this podcast, and uh, you know all kinds of train delays and work delays have got in the way, but nonetheless, I'm joined by Matt Lawrence, aka Panners and Nutmegs, the uh, Tyler Send writer on all things stats and numbers. How is it going, Matt? I am all good considering we are now just one place above the drop, or one point above the drop, and six remaining, so it's getting down to crunch time, and I'm hoping we can have a cheery a cheery podcast by the end of the season. It's amazing. that it, It's not as if I'm lining you up for these defeats, but I'm, I'm not sure we've had the chance to discuss a win when you've been on the podcast. I honestly yeah. don't think, I honestly don't think I've had a win as of yet. I think I am... I am doom and gloom, aren't I? <laughs> to be honest, I'm the, probably the most miserable person you get on these podcasts, to be honest. Oh, official doom and gloom. <laughs> yeah. Well, in that sense, let's crack on and talk about Hull. And then uh, then later on in the show, just let you know what's coming up. We'll have some pub chat where we'll have a brief look towards the play with the season, the vote, and then the mailbag, of course, and previewing that lovely trip to Norwich, who are doing a little bit, they're doing all right, let's put it that way, uh, as on Wednesday night. So let's crack on then and talk about Hull 3... Reading 1. View from the Tarhurst End. Recapping this week's championship action. So Matt, to sum this up in a line, I'm going to say that we scored the hard one and then we missed all the easy ones. You don't have to pay much attention to the highlights to realise this was a game full of chances for both teams. And ultimately in these sort of relegation battles... You have to be the one that takes the chances and you have to stand there and say, you know, maybe we were a bit lucky. Maybe they did miss a lot, but we scored ours and we're on the wrong end of that this week. And and Lewis Baker with a cracking opener from 25 yards. Yes, he has a lot of time to, to pick his spot, but he picks it brilliantly. And then from then on, it just kind of went downhill, created a lot of chances, had an offside goal ruled out. Hull took their chances and and here we are without a point. Yeah, you really can't can't take anything away from that Baker strike. He shifted it onto his left foot and absolutely slapped it in from about 25 yards out, hasn't he? And I like the fact that the keeper looks like he's had his batteries taken out and just pretty much just <laughs> stop, stop, just falls and just kind of accepts what's happening. But yeah, it is it is just a case of us being a bit of a, a blunt knife, to be honest. We had we had opportunities, both of which on the break. Uh, we had the one chance where Oliveira was in down the right, and I think it was a, a 5v2, which somehow managed to go out for a goal kick when it was almost like there were too many options available for him on the ball. Yeah, and it's yeah. one of the last things you'd expect from a guy like Oliveira. If you're wanting that opportunity to fall to anyone, it's your number nine. And it, it was one of those where it's just so easy to, to square it, but... It's happened. We didn't take the opportunity. Uh, yeah, another one at one. I think we were we won nil up with the Barrow chance as well. I think that was one one when when Mo Barrow. I think Rinomoto wins the ball quite high up the pitch. Yeah, falls to Barrow three yards out, just to keep it to beat and finds. You know, I, I don't know how wide goals are exactly. About is it about <laughs> nine yards or so? And the goalkeeper's leg is about six inches. And he yeah. hits the leg out of the nine yards. So yeah, yeah, it, that was a frustrating one. That was the one of the few times when I was watching the game because I didn't didn't manage to get up to hold myself. Uh, I was watching the game back last night in in prep for this. So um, yeah, it's one of the few times that Mo Barrow managed to get in behind. Really, I felt like, and that, that's where he's best as well when he gets in behind defenses and he's he's able to stretch them because people they're not going to catch him. And if you look at the, some of the goals that he he scored when he got the 10 last season he was getting in behind more often he was looking to beat his man I don't think he he does that as often as I'd like him to personally whether that's a preference from Gomez where he likes to come to feet but it's nice to see when he does get in behind it would have been lovely if he could have could have finished that chance off and but I don't think we can take anything away from the keeper to be honest he's done an awful lot there and and made a really good stop as well I think we shouldn't shouldn't be laying the blame at wholly at Barrow's Barrow's door there it was a very good save I thought 
Yeah, it, it is. It's one of those. It's kind of six to one, half dozen to the other, or, or words to that effect. When it comes, to, yeah. If if um if Martinez makes that save, you probably have a lot of fat Reading fans saying, "Isn't he a brilliant goalkeeper?" Yeah. Which um. Yeah, it depends which side of the fence you're sitting on, doesn't it? Yeah, and I'm not too sure Martinez covered himself in glory with this one. He kind of, he fumbled a relatively difficult shot to save for two one and put it back into danger area. His positioning for the third is very poor. Um, and and. You know, aside from the chances that we missed, which kind of asked the question, were we hard done by? We hit the bar at 1-0, albeit with a, it would have been an own goal had it gone in. We were caught on the break very easily. And I kind of wonder why that is, because that's not really something that we've had go against us very often this season. And, you know, no matter who's been in charge, I can't think of too many times when we've been so, you know, high up. And, and the balls come over the top, and we've just been e- it's been quite easy for players to run in behind. That happened for the first and third goal this time. And yeah, it seems a bit odd. Yeah, there kind of just seemed to be a, a lack of pressure on the ball with a couple of a couple of the opportunities that they did create for the goals. I think for the first one, I've, it's going to seem a bit harsh, but I think it was Baker's kind of culpable for for both of them to an extent with not getting tight enough to his man and, and pressure pressuring he's kind of he's there but he's not at a distance where he can affect or influence the play it's still it's almost kind of a gesture defending as I like to like to think of it it's almost you're there but you're not actually affecting or impacting the player's decision yeah. making at all yeah and it does still allow for for the likes of Bowen and Grzycki to run in behind as they were doing for for the goals as well and for the chances that Hull had well, for the, I mean, the chances, you know, for for Grzycki, I think they were relatively straightforward finishes. So yeah, there was, there's that to consider. And, and with that in mind, and with the miss in mind, do you think we were hard done by? Is this a game that, I mean, on another day, I think for me, I think we were kind of hard done by, in the fact that when you, as I say at the top of the show, when you're in these late season games, you have to be the one that takes the chances and. You know, sometimes it is just a, a flip of a coin, a roll of a dice, whether they go in or not. It seems like, in terms of our own finishing, we were a little hard done by not to get another goal. But at the same point, Hull had themselves a lot of chances they missed. They had a couple of, of you know, decent chances from corners and, and whatnot to score. So where do you sit on the whole hard done by debate? Because I must admit, I'm really struggling. I think at the moment, I'm just about thinking that we are a bit hard done by. Because I think... It, 2-1 I think we if Barrow takes that chance I think we go on and win that game I think yeah the Barrow chance is cru- was kind of the crux of the matter really if that goes in we can look to shut up shop and, and really kind of batten down the hatches and I do think we can probably squeeze out a result from there but on the course of the whole game I thought it was it was fairly even to be honest I mean Hull probably had slightly more in the final third than us if you look at a couple of our chances, they came from whole mistakes. They weren't fashioned from good play from ourselves. I think if you had a look at the uh, one of the shot maps, for example, I think three of our five shots we had were from 25-odd yards out. And the only real chance we had was the Barrow one, taking into account that we didn't have a shot at all from the Oliveira one, the Oliveira chance as well, which was squandered. But in terms of feeling hard done by, at the end of the day, you're coming up against a team in Hull that I think have scored two or more goals in the last 10 home games now. Yeah, yeah. So you're up against it from the start. You know if you're not clinical, then you're going to get punished by them with the likes of Grzycki and, and Bowen up to, uh, out wide as well. And I thought Grzycki was one of them that caused us problems most of the afternoon, to be honest. The fact that he go one way or the other... He, he did cause us quite a few problems in that aspect as well. So, I, to be honest, I don't feel too hard done by. I would have taken a point as well, but I don't think I can be too too disappointed in in coming away with without any points because Hull are a very decent side and at home they're scoring a lot of goals. And you can see why on yesterday's uh, or on Saturday's game, even they create an awful lot of chances. Like you said, they missed a few as well. Yeah, I and mean, it's interesting, isn't it, that, that, that Hull are one of those teams who played them early in the season. They were 
genuinely terrible. And they were playing, awful, um, awful, awful, weren't they? I know. We, and it looked like it, a different team yesterday uh, on Saturday, sorry. And it was 3-0 that we beat them at home, and it felt like, I mean, two of those goals were late on, but it honestly could have been one of those days a better Reading team would have put five or six past them. And it shows the, the work of a manager, and perhaps people would say Gomez is kind of doing what Atkins is doing to a slightly lesser effect, but what Atkins has done there is incredible. Whole have scored 34 goals this year. Only the likes of Leeds, Sheffield United, uh, Villa and, and so on have scored more than that. So they are right up there in that respect. And uh, I think, for the because I know you sent in a couple of questions, uh, Map, to the podcast um, over the weekend saying, you know... That's before I knew I was coming on. <laughs> <laughs> was it realistic that we could get three points? It was one of the things that you asked. And I mean, you can answer your own question if you want, but my, my opinion on it is, I think you have to go to these sort of teams, and this is what I'm going to say for the Norwich game, is that you have to go to these teams and think, today is the day they will slip up. If they give us one little sniff, we will make sure that we are the one team that gets gets the point off them, or gets the three points off them. And we're just not quite good enough to do that at the moment, are we? If teams give us loads of chances, or if, you know, we get a bit of a lucky break in injury time, and we you know, you know, know, we, we grab, a, grab the win that way, then great. But at the moment... When it comes to games where it is on a knife edge, one or two chances, you know, you take your one or two chances and and that's how you get your goals, it's it's just not favouring us. Yeah, I think you've pretty much hit the nail on the head there, to be honest. It's you've got to be, it's one of those where you've got to be at your top of your game and you've got to be looking for the others to, to kind of lower their performance as well and then for you to be able to, to capitalise upon that. So, yeah, I really, to be honest, I think you've hit the nail on the head. Uh, obviously, every game you've, it's realistic to get three points. It's a bit of a stupid question from ever sent that in, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Both teams are there and it's nil nil at the start. But um, yeah, like, I, we created, we had chances to put the game to bed. So of course, it was realistic that we we were going to be given off. We got opportunities and we could have taken them. It's just a, a shame that we looked. I felt we looked slightly more open against Hull than we have done in, in recent weeks. I don't know what you you thought of that. I'm, I know you mentioned that they managed to get in behind quite a bit. But, yeah, I just really felt that we looked slightly more open. I couldn't quite put my finger on on why that was, to be honest. It feels to me like we played a high line that we haven't necessarily played too much. But I don't, I don't know if we've realised that high line more because the there's been lots of pressure. actually done... Don't yeah, they've actually it. exposed it because of a lack of pressure in midfield. But I felt Rina Motter added a bit of fight in there. I don't know whether it was he got bypassed slightly or... Well, he's only one man at the end of the day. Yeah, that's, is, a, yeah, that's the thing. thing. thing and he's a it's young his, player as well. Yeah, it's his Baker doing doing enough in there. I mean, for me, on, on the third goal as well, I didn't think he would do quite enough... Yeah, it's, I think, it's it's hard, a, I think it's, it was the third one. It's hard with Baker as well because we know that we are kind of putting a square peg in a in a roundish hole there. So yeah, yeah, it is one of those. That... Yeah, you're looking at, and he's got some real defensively. Yeah, he looks. Sorry, it was the second goal I was meaning, not the third with Baker. And but yeah, for me, I think he's he was dropping in between the centre halves and spraying things around, keeping things ticking over. And he does that beautifully. He's just really nice, sets a tempo, two-footed, can go both ways, good technician. I mean, I think there's a couple of passes he sprayed out. And you're, like, you're quite a serious footballer in, in terms of technical ability at this level. But it's just the question marks over whether he's got it defensively out of, when out of possession, for me. Yeah, and that's something that Jose Gomez is going to have to work out. Then let's, let's hear what Jose Gomez said after the match. He sort of questioned Reading's focus and their their mental uh, concentration and their ability to see through the 90 minutes. Uh, So let's hear what Jose said and then we'll come back and talk about where Reading stand in the overall relegation picture to round off the recap. In the first half, um, we did very well. Not 100%, but almost we, we, we blocked, we stopped, we defended very well. We blocked their attack. Um, and the first, uh, in the first 15 minutes of the second half, 
um, we lost our focus and our organization and we we ran away from our game you know maybe the intention of the players were was like protect the the three points and if you if we play out of our game is is we can show um, our weak points and the goal is not that the goal is playing under our process and when this didn't happen uh, it was advantage for them and they they used very well we could score i think it was the 2-1 the barrow uh, very good recover ball from andy and and Barr was alone with the goalkeeper. We could score the other, the second goal, and every, everything should be different if we score that goal. And in football, it's like that. If you if you don't kill um, sooner or later, they will kill you, and that's that's what happened. Uh, so now we we are where we are. You know, we are in the position that uh, we must look to to the next game with maximum energy, maximum strength. Um, and uh, it will be another very tough game. We play Wednesday against Norwich, um, uh, but I, I believe that if we if we keep the focus in our maximum, we we can get something from there. So as we said at the top of the show, Reading are on 40 points from 40 games, one point with uh, eight better goal difference than Rotherham. We're on the same points with. Four worse goal difference than Millwall, if that makes sense. Wigan are one point above us, pretty much the same goal difference. Birmingham and QPR, four points above us, five points above the relegation zone. Bolton and Ipswich are gone now, basically. Ipswich winning at Bolton on the weekend certainly cured that one. So, you know, we're looking at one, two, three, four, five, six teams for one spot. And Reading aren't in it at the moment. But, you know, compared to where we are now... Not necessarily to where we were last week, but to where we were one nil up, and the fact that Rotherham won, the fact yes. that Millwall won, the fact that Wigan got a late draw away to Bristol City, Birmingham won, all of those wins, by the way, against decent teams, Nottingham Forest, West Brom, and Leeds. Really, there's you know if you could if you could have painted a, a weekend to be as bad as possible, I think I can't imagine what else would have happened. Yeah, I do think it was it was pretty much as bad as possible. I remember checking my phone at. At half time, seeing we were one nil up and six points clear of the relegation spots, and I thought, "Oh, we this is it. We can we can start to relax. That's a, a two game buffer, especially given our our goal difference over Rotherham slightly better than them. But yeah, we've been really dragged back into the into the thick of it, haven't we? Where it's we're going to be fighting for for our lives for the the next six games. Are to pardon the cliche, are they are cup finals now, aren't they? Every single one of them's a cup final for for us and Rotherham, really. And like you say, some of the others have been have been really dragged into their QPR can't buy a win. If if the teams like us and Rotherham can pick up a couple of a couple of wins from now until the end of the season, and QPR carry on the vein of form that they're in, then they could realistically get dragged into it as well. I think yeah, we've got. Yeah slightly better goal difference than QPR as well who are on minus 19 we're on minus 17 as well so there's a there's a lot of teams in there Millwall on the same points as us as well like you said and Wigan on 41 I mean if you're looking at the table or the form table us and Rotherham are looking like the form sides down there which is is one way of looking at it well, in the last six it's games, positive way of looking at it. Yeah, in the last six games, we are still. I think it's we might, might drop to ninth in the form table now. But out of all of those teams, QPR are, are the worst by some distance, and then it's Birmingham. Yeah, the QPR have been on an absolutely wretched form run of form, haven't they? Yeah. But yeah, like you say, we're I think we're averaging one point three eight points at the moment in the last in the last eight games that we've had, and which is pretty much matched by. By Rotherham, but then you look at the teams above us. We're going to 0.88 and QPR 0.63. So if we're running at double double the rate for the next six games as QPR are, both us and Rotherham could could feasibly leapfrog them. Yeah, and I think it's when it comes to you know us going to Norwich and, and whatnot, teams from the bottom are going to beat teams from the top. Maybe only once, maybe a couple of times in the next few weeks, but it is going to happen. And 
Reading, uh, you know, it, it might be that down to that sort of nicking an away win at Norwich or something like that might just be the thing that keeps us up. And yeah. that is the level we're at now with this sort of relegation battle. I don't think you, we can, you know, go to Norwich on Wednesday and say, oh, well, never mind, because it's it's in that stage. So, yeah, well, the, in terms of the, uh, the fixtures on the midweek, just to update you on what's going to be going on, uh, Rotherham at home to Aston Villa, Birmingham at home to Sheffield United, Wigan, they go to Hull, so three very difficult games there, but all, of course, perfectly winnable if you turn up and play very well. And, um, yeah, Millwall at home to QPR on Wednesday night is a huge game. If Millwall win that, then you, as we're saying, QPR really are right in the mire, and, and you know, QPR winning that might just elevate them, be enough to bring them out of it. Looking ahead to Saturday as well, um, when we're at home to Brentford. So Rotherham have Stoke away. And Mill will go to Sheffield United. Uh, you know, it's they're, they're only almost only difficult games at the moment. Wigan hosts Norwich on the weekend as well. So that's the state of play we're in at the moment. Teams, even when you host Sheffield United, even when you host Norwich and, and go to these teams, you still you know, have to be in that frame of mind that any of your our rivals could well pick up points, and therefore we're going to have to do it. As simple as that. So we'll talk a bit more about the Norwich game in a little bit. Let's get on there and we'll have a quick pub chat and jump into the mailbag to uh, keep episode 191 on the road. The Talhurst End Podcast. By Reading fans, for Reading fans. So it's a bit premature for player of the season, but in pub chat, Matt, that's what I briefly wanted to have a look at. I don't want us to pick our, you know, top one. I think we can probably just about pick a top three at the moment. But the club have officially opened their player of the season uh, voting. I think it goes until just about the end of the month. Um, we at the Tyler's End would like to do ours at the end of the season because who knows what's going to happen. And certainly in this season, anything can happen. So the players that are kind of in the mix at the moment, you've got Andy Yeardom, Yaku Mate, Liam Moore, Tyler Blackett and John Swift. Those are the players that I've mentioned because those are the only players who have started 25 league games or more you go you got likes of Andy Vanamotta's only played 20 league games this season and we were at, thir- we were at 40 by the way so that's half and uh, you know I- I'm not sure who else you really look at after that players like Emiliano Martinez only played 12 so is Matt Miazga so I don't think they can really be in with a shout unless they you know score winning penalty on the last day of the season so What's your overview of the player of the season standings at the moment? Then, what sort of names jump out to you? What sort of, you know, is it is this one of those years where we look at the the options in front of us and just go, well, that explains why we're in a relegation battle. Yeah, I think you summed it up. It does listing off the names it does explain why we are in a in a real relegation battle when you're looking at two guys. You've just named two guys that have come in in January as potential player of the season. Uh, for me, probably the obvious name is is Year Dom. He's been one of our most consistent performers throughout the season, I think. And considering he's been brought in on a free as well, uh, he's he's adapted well. There's been a lot of change at the heart of defence that we talked about throughout the season. A lot of change with the goalkeeper as well that he's had to deal with. He's played with numerous players in front of him: Mate, McCleary, Aluko. So it's all been the side's been chopped and changed, and for me, he's been one of the the more consistent players. I feel like I know what I'm going to get from from Year Dom. So he'd probably be my my standout for or my number one contender for Player of the Season. I don't know how you feel about about that nomination. I must admit or how that, it aligns with yours. Yeah, I must admit the Year Dom is pretty much the standout for me as well at the moment. If uh, is it Liam Moore won it? pretty convincingly last season of course Ali Habsi the year before that I don't think Moore is necessarily going to be in with a shout this year I think that it's you know 50% popularity contest 50% how well you've performed over the season and yeah. Moore isn't quite yeah. as popular as he used to be at this club um, for various reasons and you know the fact that we've been a bit terrible as well this year um, yeah Blackett as I mentioned Blackett and Swift because they've played a lot but I don't think they'll do enough to, to figure in many fans votes and then I think you're looking at Yaku Mate, I think for me he's in my top three. He's not done enough to win it. 
because you know a striker who scored eight goals in a season is not player of the season material unless he scores ten between now and the end of the season. Then I'll yeah. consider it. Yeah. And I think to my top three in probably the order that I think it's going to be in at the moment is it's going to be Yeardom, then Mate, then Rinomosa. I think even though Rinomosa's not played that much, I think he'll, as the popularity vote comes into it, I think he'll favour or he'll get quite a lot of favour from the fans in that sense. Yeah, I probably would would switch Rinomota and mate or I definitely put Rinomota in second just for the the impact I feel he's had on the side and yeah you can feel how much we've missed him in the games that he's not been there and how open we've been and how exposed we've been and for a guy to have have come into the team and this really been his breakthrough season in senior football it's been it's been really impressive to see how well he's taken and adapted to the game at this level and how much of a crucial figure he's made himself within our, our first 11. And then, yeah, looking at Mate, he's been a bit streaky. He had that period where he bang, banged in a few goals, and I think it was about five or six goals in seven or eight games, and he was a bit streaky there. Bod Varson as well had a start where he was, I think he scored six or seven, didn't he, mm. in as many games. He's been a bit streaky as well, swift as has come and gone. There's been moments of magic like the other week against, uh, with the free kick. Um, but yeah, there's not really been too many consistent performers from the, the guys that are on permanent contracts. It's, you're looking towards, towards the loans that have really made, you feel like they've made a more of an impact this season. Uh, Martinez has been very impressive. Miazga, I feel, I think you know from, if you follow my Twitter account, I'm a big Matt Miazga fan. And I think he's been the best loanee that we've signed. I think he's been the best loanee. If you look at the comparison or the difference in security, and even as a fan, I feel more secure with him at the back than I did with Thiago Elori. That's not taking anything, anything away from Elori because he's a very decent footballer. The problem was he was just a bit culpable when it came to defending his box and so on and so forth. And, all the things that Miazga does well, like winning his headers, we just look so much more secure with him. So I think if we're going off kind of impact that each player has had, I'd probably order it with Yeardom, Rinomota, and then Miazga. Yeah, I think if the voting would have been taking place right at the end of the season, maybe we'll see on the Tyler's one, Tyler's end one, I think if you do add in those extra six games and let Miazga continue to make the impact, I think he's got a much better chance. But Yeah, definitely. At this stage, he's played 12 times, ultimately. I mean, how many of those games would be won? I don't know to count at the moment, but it's a, it's a difficult to, to think that he will curry too much favour with the fans. Quick point on Mate before we finish off, and I've just created a little stat here, is that the months of September, December, January... February and April all have one thing in common and that is that they're all months that Yakumete has not scored a goal in. So you said he's streaky. He's only scored, he scored once in August, a bunch of times in October and November and twice in March and that's it. Which, you know, in terms of player of the season, streaky. Tender, yeah, that's pretty much it, isn't it? So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's something. Yeah. That, that, that We've been fortunate that his streakiness and Bod Varson's streakiness haven't over- overlapped, and we I'm had. Sure, all of Bod Varson's goals came in August. They were pretty much all August, September, weren't they? They were very early on, towards the beginning of the season. Then Mate went to number nine and kind of took over the mantle and looked incredibly streaky until the end of November. Until November, and then the goals have totally, <laughs> totally dried up, haven't they? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean that. That's the thing with championship players, isn't it? You want players like Mate to, as that you know, he's still a bit young and still, as we say, a bit streaky. You want him to be the, the the perhaps the number two striker behind the number one like Oliveira, but we haven't had that sort of luxury for the entire season. And even you know, this, these past few weeks, it's been a bit on and off. So, yeah, that player with the season vote, as I say, Tyler Stem will be waiting until the season is over. The clubs is open now, um, and find someone out of that lot is all I can say <laughs> yeah. uh, for fans wanting to vote on it uh, of course we'll uh, see, keep an eye on it and, and let you know who wins but for now we will jump into the mailbag 
Get social with the boys. Find them on Twitter at the Tarhurst End and Facebook.com forward slash the Tarhurst End. So John House kicks us off this week with a message on Twitter saying that the whole game only looks bad because of the other results. Before Preston, with these two games, most would have settled for with still being out of the relegation zone. And on that vein, Daniel says that he, he thinks it just feels like anything can happen now. Classic championship where teams can beat each other left and right will go down to the wire probably. And that is a sentiment that I think we've we've certainly echoed in, in the past uh past few moments and just a quick question before we go on to the next uh, point Matt is that John says before Preston with these two games most would have settled with being out of the relegation zone three points from those two games do you think in you know all objectivity is that is that okay it's perfectly fine isn't it one win from two I really I really can't complain it's about picking up wins as and where you can Preston came to us in a great vein of form and we managed to get three points off of them so yeah I mean three from six can't really argue with that if you're in a relegation in a relegation fight and you're picking up three points in every other game yeah fine I'm not too too unhappy it was just more the fact that all the other teams won around us on Saturday that like he said John said it makes it look an awful lot worse than it has been yeah, it's a good point there. Uh, and uh, Stephen Lewenden on on the same same vein as Daniel said, it's a fact so that it will go down to the last game of the season. Eddie Cor saying that form has improved since Gomez came in. If we go down, it was the lost points early in the season that did it. I'd actually go back. I'd actually back this team to dig out a result when it needed more than any recent Reading team. And well, I, I'm I'm kind of I have my reservations about that to an extent, Matt, because. Jose Gomez oversaw the Reading team that conceded a late equaliser against Rotherham at home, conceded late equaliser away to Bolton. Didn't, I mean, you know, didn't do particularly well at home to Swansea in a 4-1 defeat. That was one of his first games in charge, yes. But we've been beaten 4-0 by Sheffield United. We've been beaten 3-0 by Leeds. In terms of this team's ability to sort of, you know, get over the line, the winning mentality... I, I do obviously think that Gomez has improved it, but do you think it's improved quite enough to be a you know a non relegation threat team? Yeah, I'm just having a look at the the form table over the last twelve games, and we're currently sat thirteenth in the, in kind of mid table form with seventeen points from twelve games. So if you think about that in comparison to to the total number of points that we've picked up this season, you're looking at nearly half of our points coming in in the last 12 games of a 40 a 40 game season so I do think there's been a, a real significant upturn in, in what Gomez has done yes we've lost the odd game and the ones we have lost we've conceded conceded a fair few goals we've conceded four against Swansea three at home against Leeds and then we had a defeat away to Sheffield United as well at the end of the day the the table's still going to be showing as you've collected zero points on that day. Goal difference still isn't too much of a worry with Rotherham looking slightly worse than us. So for me, yeah, I do think, I do think Gomez deserves a lot of credit and I do think there's been a real, real upturn in, in what he's been doing with limited resources, to be honest. He didn't, he wasn't, he's had to, to get rid of players, had to be, as in his words, be creative within the the transfer market. We've utilised the the loan market very well, and uh, yeah, I do think he deserves some credit with the the football that we're playing at the moment. Well, the, yeah, the football we're playing is 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 a, an improvement as well, and fans wanted entertainment. Remember when Stan wanted was Stan was being sacked, and Clement gave that in the form of some high high scoring games that didn't always go our way, and that's to an extent been continued. But now we're playing a bit more than. You know, your classically entertaining brand of football and fans, no matter what style of football you play, you'll always go home happy with a two goals to turn around the two one defeat into yeah. a three two win at home and yeah. away from home at Ipswich as well. That sort of that sort of win will always send fans home happy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Lee Burgess then asked, "Do you think two more wins will be enough for Reading to stay up, and which games will we win? Two wins will take us to forty six points. That'll be enough." You know, if Rotherham will have to pick up eight points pretty much in the next six games to beat that, 
with obviously Millwall and and the rest of them picking up just about the same or less. Um, I think that probably would be enough, but I think it might well come down to goal difference. Of the games we've got left, I must be honest, I think the Brentford game is a must win. And I think we're going to... I think we've got a huge chance of picking up a win either at home to West Brom or away to Middlesbrough because those are two teams, kind of the same about Bristol City, but I'm less optimistic about that. Those two games, West Brom and Middlesbrough, are two teams that could well be watching. I mean, Boa certainly at the moment are. West Brom's just about starting to watch their season unravel before their eyes. And in the last few weeks the pressure that is going to be on those players. Yes, there's a lot on us, but going to place like Middlesbrough, there's always a little bit of a sense of it's a free hit, etc., etc. So the pressure on those players, especially when you're at home against West Brom, the fans at Middlesbrough on their own players back, I think those are as good a chances as you can really hope for this stage of the season. So I think two wins might be enough. I'm just about owing to say it will be. And I think those... You know, two out of those three games, I think, uh, are probably the most likely for it to come. Yeah, I do think. Hope you'd hope that two wins from from six would be enough, and perhaps a draw here or there. Like you say, I do think the Brentford game at home is going to be a real crucial one. They, I, they haven't got the greatest away form, and a, as much as they are one of the better footballing sides, you could say they've got a bit of a, a soft underbelly as well, and can be can be got at. So I think if we're up for it and we can we can really get at them and the likes of someone like Mate, if we, we can utilise him and kind of almost be a bit of a bully boy, we can we can look to to try and cause some damage against them. Uh like yeah, Borough in a dismal run of form and in the last eight they're bottom of the the form table in the championship. It looks like their their hopes of uh playoff spots slipping away from them. Um that may be gone with two games to go in the season when we go and we go and play them. So fingers crossed by then their players are are on the holiday or on their holidays. Yeah, well let's uh let's hope that by the time we play them that is that is the ideal date. And Dave Della Riviere saying as well, shame about the whole result, but we lucked out last weekend, so we have to take the rough with the smooth. Where do you think the next points are coming from? I can't help but think we'll get something against Boa as they aren't having a good time at present, which uh, certainly echoes what we're going into there. And I'm really, I like, the, I know the Birmingham home game is at the end of the season, but I'm absolutely avoiding saying that that's going to be one of the two, you know, that a win yeah. against them when they're just over the line because last day of the season, I do not want to think about having to win that game. Yeah, you don't, you really don't want to be having to win that game, especially with someone like Shea Adams who's been in such great form this season banging in the goals and you don't want him coming coming to the Medici and kind of continuing that run of form and earning himself a move to the Premier League for example No we certainly don't do very well when it comes to crunch games that we have to win and JPR asks does Jose Gomez stay if it's League One? His job, after all, was survival. And Clive Ratton added on to that, would he want to stay or would they remove him? I don't think the club would sack Jose Gomez if we go down. I don't think the club has the money to, unless there's a relegation break in his contract. I also don't think that they realistically believe they'd get someone better. Because, as, as we've kind of just discussed, he's, his form in the championship of the Reading is relatively decent, certainly comfortable mid-table. So... I don't think he'll be sacked. I don't know whether he'd get another opportunity. I know he's always wanted to manage in England. He's unlikely to just go back to Portugal because he got relegated with Reading, or if he gets relegated with Reading. He might get an opportunity somewhere else, but I honestly don't think he necessarily would. So I think he'd probably end up staying. I think the decision's up to him, to be honest. Yeah. I think, yeah, if he wants to stay then I don't think... I think the fans will be over the moon if he wants to stay, to be honest. I can't see many fans within the fan base being opposed to him staying with us, us going down to League One. It's then coming down to what sort of contract of the hierarchy offered him. Is there a a release break where he gets a reduced payoff or whatever, if relegation is the is the outcome of the season? But I do think we could do an awful lot worse than him being at the helm come the start of next season 
Well, yeah, hopefully it's not something that we'll actually have to worry yeah. about. There Fingers was... crossed. The other question is, who do we, if he does go, then who do we look to go get in? But that's a, a whole new conversation for itself. And we need to find out which league we're in yeah. <laughs> before we can start having it, unfortunately. Well, hopefully one that we won't need to have. But I do know what you mean, because there's... If you know if the passing football style takes us down, is it the sort of thing we stick with? Do we go someone who's academy or sign players? God, that's, it's probably going to take an entire podcast. And luckily, I think that we probably would do an entire podcast on Reading going down to League One. So uh, yeah. we'll save that issue for if and when we cross that bridge. Peter Griffiths asked the last question off the mailbag. Simply, does anyone know what has happened to Side Ezra Talahi? Uh, the simple answer to that is no. If you follow him on Instagram, I'm also no. He he's occasionally in in Reading. It looks like he's quite often in in England side as a Talahi. If you look at his Instagram, he you know goes around doing his little bits and dressing up in his nice clothes and whatnot. It's pretty much what he posts about. Is it, it, there is no indication from the club that he's not with the club, but there's also no evidence that he is with the club because he's not been playing. And ultimately, it wouldn't. Um, wouldn't surprise me too much. I don't know, to be honest, how long his loan deal you know, lasts, what kind of conditions are on it, because it was only announced that it was going to be a season-long loan when he came in. But if the club have decided we've got six games to go, he's not going to be fit, I wouldn't necessarily be sure why they keep him around. So don't expect to see him is, uh, is all I'm going to say, but I certainly don't yeah, say that. I'm, on I'm not, getting my hopes up for, not getting my hopes up for, for seeing him appear again. Yeah. In a Reading shirt. And to be honest, the cameos we did see, I was quite impressed with, to be honest. Yeah. It was, it was a real shame that he, d- he did get injured. This is true, but to be honest, when we're six games into the end of the season, he's never played under this manager. Is it really that important for him to come back into the team? I don't think it's the the right time for him to come back into the team. It, it'd probably take him a bit of time to get up to speed as well with in terms of match fitness and sharpness. So really, we're set with, with what we've got and we can kind of thank you for for turning up but it was a bit unfortunate that you got injured really yeah hopefully he's not we've not lost too much money in that sort of deal and and maybe you know maybe Gomez does like what he has seen of him and his fitness is going to clear up maybe there's a chance of keeping hold of him for next season which I wouldn't be mad about at this point in time but that is something that really as fans we are out in the cold about so let's talk about something that will certainly be chilly and that is Cabo Road on Wednesday night in any other business the Talhurst End Podcast. Read the blog on thetalhurstend.com. So here we go then. The classic free hit. If you want one free hit of a game any time, any season, it is a way to the league leaders when they've won God knows how many games on the trot. 7.45 away to Norwich on Wednesday, April 10th. They're top of the league. They're the highest scorers. We've lost to them in our last four meetings. And Matt, you pointed out very helpfully on Twitter that they've scored 14 goals in that time. Although there was one particular game when they did very well. This is, um, you know, all I'm going to say is that Norwich have to slip up somewhere. They are not going to win every single game between now and the end of the season. This may as well be the one that they slip up in. Yeah, you're hoping they've got to slip up at some point, but they've only lost once since uh, the turn of January and turn of the new year. And that was away to Preston. Uh, you look at the teams that they've dropped points against in 2019. It's Brentford, West Brom, Sheffield United and Preston. Brentford, the only one in the bottom half of the table there. And even then, there you could easily say they're streaks ahead of us in terms of quality. Mm. So it's going to be, a, for me, it's a real uphill battle. This is this is one where it is literally a free hit. If we take a nil-nil or nick a one-all, fantastic. Anything here is is a bonus for me. They've won the last eight as well, so they're in. They're the best team in this league, and they've some of the football they've been playing as well in recent weeks has been really, really good stuff. I think I saw I can't remember who it was, but someone compared it to to Manchester City in the Premier League you know when they kind of turn it on and the other teams within the league just can't it's kind of like the inevitable is going to happen and Norwich are going to win well they're, they're, it is kind of like Man City in a way isn't it when it's the ultimate confidence that comes with being I mean they are currently eight points clear of third place so they are going to go up they are they've scored at least three goals in 10 of their last 12 home matches 
It's just silly, isn't it? It's, it's, <laughs> the, the problem is with this game is that even if we're 2-0 up with five minutes to go, there is going to be a serious doubt that we're going to win this game. Yeah, 100%. best thing we can hope for is a Timu Pukio in goal. <laughs> well, he does look off it in the back of the net, so at yeah. least they keep that up. One of the interesting stats as well, actually, in terms of this game, is that they have been at Red- Norwich versus Reading has been a complete goal fest in the sense that there's only been one clean one match in the last 11 meetings has featured a clean sheet, which was a 0-0 draw in the Premier League some time ago. One draw in 10 as well. So the team, you know, it's a case of you score four, I score five, and I wouldn't necessarily bet on Reading for this one. But let's, yeah. talk, uh, let's talk predictions then. Just to recap what happened on the weekend, Johnny Williams was the only person to predict a whole win. So the state of play in the Prediction League is now Handbags on 31, Ollie 30, Johnny 29 and Wim, the early season leader, back on 28. And also a quick word, uh, Tom Cocker, if you haven't been listening to the weekend preview, he features in our Prediction League. He will be leaving us at the end of the season because he has already moved jobs, in fact, from the Wokey paper to the Bournemouth Echo. So if you want to follow Tom Cocker on Twitter, he is now fully invested in all things cherries. So he will be uh, moving on from the Tyler stand or... Might have, might have already even moved on from Tyler Stend, in fact. So, uh, so good luck to Tom, and thank you very much for him to him for coming on the show and and talking to Reading. We, as you know, even the, even when the professionals come on, we pay them in in gratitude rather than anything else. So, a uh, huge thanks to Tom for that. But alas, he is uh, pretty much destined to finish pretty near the bottom of the prediction league in his uh, in his season in it. So, prediction time then, Matt. What's the uh, what's the official verdict for for Norwich Reading? I'm gonna go th- really optimistic and go three nil Norwich. Yeah, I, I think I, we're gonna get turned over to be honest. I, know, I think we'll score. I think there might there's probably gonna be at least two minutes of this game where we think we might get something, and I know that's not very much in ninety. Yeah, but I think there is gonna be that two minutes, and so maybe it's a, a sneaky Yaku Mate goal or something. And Norwich have been involved in some ridiculous games this year. I'm, I'm, yeah, there's definitely goals guaranteed. If you look at their games, it's, they've been involved in some goal fests, like you say. Yeah, and I'm convinced that they're going to slip up at some point this season. That said, I'm going to pick a 3-1 defeat for the Prediction League because, you know, I've, I've got to pick up some points. Really. <laughs> I'm thinking about my position in that, although I'm certainly not going to be winning it. But yeah, it's, I don't know, it's just this, this Norwich game, it's, it is one of those that... I don't see many teams picking up points over this midweek set of fixtures. It seems like there's bigger fish to fry coming up and maybe Jose Gomez will just... Do you think we'll benefit from having the pressure off us or do you think ultimately we kind of need that tension at the moment? We need that fire in our belly, something to fight for and and a game we believe we can win? I don't think, yeah. I don't think the tension is a bad thing. But I think you'd hope that the tension would still be there. You're, You're fighting for your life to to stay up you, the players contracts I'm sure some of them however much their contract is will depreciate by an awful lot if they've got a relegation clause in there so they've got they've got a vested interest regardless of who we're playing it's it's just a, math, a manner of you have to go out there be professional do your job if you can't up against a team that's better than you on the day hold your hands up and say say they're better than you but I don't feel like this this current crop now would have rolled over as easily as as earlier in the season in this game. I feel feel like we could hold out slightly longer. Yeah, so we're going to make it to, to seven minutes rather than five. Before. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, fingers crossed. Exactly. That is that is really the case. And any any Reading fans going up to Norwich on on Wednesday night, I doff my cap to you because it's going to be a, a yeah. Long well journey. done, well done to them. And hopefully, we'll all be jealous of you witnessing one of the most important wins of Reading's. You know, definitely. If, if we win, let's put it this way: if we win, it's the most important win of the season. Um, at this at that stage, so that would be what we're after, and. That draws to a close this episode of the Tyler Sen Podcast. Thank you very much, Matt Lawrence, for joining us. You're no problem. Panners and Nutmegs on Twitter, of course. Yes. And we will be back next week after not only the Norwich game, of course, the Brentford one as well, which you can catch the preview for in Weekend Preview later in the week with Ollie. This is a game that Reading are just going to have to hope that a couple of decisions go their way, hope that a couple of balls bounce their way and hope that Mo Barrow learns how to score from three yards. If we can do that, <laughs> then we got a chance. Come on, you ass.